introduce, introduce our uh, speaker this morning. Tapio's work has elucidated how rainfall extremes change with climate, how changes in cloud cover can destabilize the climate system, and how winds and weather on planetary bodies such as Jupiter and Titan come about. He's currently leading the Climate Modeling Alliance, whose mission is to build the first Earth system model that automatically learns from diverse data sources to produce accurate climate predictions. Named one of the 20 best brains under 40 by Discover Magazine, Dr. Schneider is a David and Lucille Packard Fellow, an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow, and a Fellow of the American Geophysical Union. He's also a recipient of the James R. Holton Award of the American Geophysical Union and of the Rosenthal Award of the University of Miami. So welcome, Tapio. Yeah, thank you, David, for the introduction, and thanks for having me and for being here. Um, you are, in many ways, the future of computational science and engineering, and I want to focus on this one small part of computational science and engineering, climate science, but arguably one of the biggest computational and engineering and science problems there are. So I will talk about this CLIMA project and our approach to climate science. Um, a bit of motivation that all of you are, are a climate scientist. In fact, very few of you are. Um, but it's pretty clear to you why, why we are talking about climate change. Earth has warmed about 1.2 degrees over the last 150 years. You've heard about various agreements, the Paris Agreement stipulating that we should limit warming to 1.5 degrees ideally, or two degrees, that's really the stated goal. 1.2 degrees we have had already had, and the question is where we are going. Um, if you would want to limit warming to two degrees, we would need to drastically cut emissions effectively immediately. To just have <clears throat> a, uh, a chance of limiting warming to two degrees, the IPCC estimate would need to reduce CO2 emissions by roughly 30% by 2030, so the next seven years, which is a theoretically possible thing to do, but practically probably not. Um, 1.5 degrees is a more, more ambitious target. I mean, it requires even more, more radical emissions that, in my view, is, are not feasible to achieve. So Earth is warming. Eventually, we'll find a way, um, thanks, for example, to DOE research, to reduce emissions eventually to net zero, so that there's net, no net carbon emissions. It will take a while. Once we achieve that, once carbon emissions have been reduced, we all have the ancillary benefit of having clearer air because burning fossil fuels comes with air pollution, which is a health hazard, killing millions every year, so we clearly want cleaner air. The uh, rather ironic side effect of cleaner air, however, is that it will also get warmer just from cleaner air alone because pollution reflects sunlight and that cools Earth right now. Here is an estimate of how much cooling comes from air pollution. So here's uh, the, the three bars indicate what part of the warming is due to which factors. So the total human influence is just over one degree, 1.2 degrees by now. This is from a few years ago, IPCC report. Um, the well-mixed greenhouse gases, so CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, are responsible, well, for more than 1.2 degrees, 1.5 degrees, a bit more by now. And there is a human cooling effect due to air pollution, um, which is hard to estimate how big it really is. It could be something like half a degree, meaning if you have cleaner air, we just get this warming from reduced air pollution alone. So that alone will get us above the 1.5 degree target um, and probably above the two degree target. So greenhouse gases are responsible for all warming that occurred. In fact, they're responsible for more than the warming that we have seen because of this offsetting cooling effect from air pollution. Um, in the best possible case, we'll have to live in a world that will be about two degrees warmer globally, probably a bit more than two degrees, I think. And um, here is just what this means more spatially resolved. So two degrees in the global mean means considerably more warming, for example, in in high latitudes in the Arctic, it can be four or five degrees warming and more. Um, generally more warming over land than over oceans, so two degrees is not 
a mean shift globally of two degrees, but there's a mean shift that's larger regionally, especially over land, especially in high latitudes. So that's what we'll have to live with in one way or another before um, I hope we find a way to reduce emissions. Global warming is not what you experience. Um, it sounds perhaps a bit abstract, but it's a good metric of why climate change matters for a simple reason that just about any impact that matters to you scales with global mean temperature. Here's one example from a paper a while back from Sonia Sinevaratne. This is global mean warming on the x-axis and the y-axis is the percentage increase in intense rainfall, in this particular case in Southeast Asia, um, over, for various climate models and uh, various degrees of warming realized over uh, increasing time. And the bottom line is that the intensity of increased rain rainfall scales with global mean warming. So global mean warming is not what you experience, but it's a good proxy for just about any impact that you would want to think about. So it's useful to talk about global mean warming just because heat waves, intense rain rainfall, and the like all scales with global mean warming. One example of impacts we already are seeing, um, this is a picture of Hurricane Harvey in Texas in uh, 2000. 17, 2016, um, that devastated Houston, led to devastating rainfall. And there were a number of independent studies published soon thereafter that estimated that the probability of the rainfall that actually occurred, the probability of that happening, has roughly tripled by recent global warming alone. So if you're, say, an insurer or reinsurer and want to um, estimate risks of um, damages from hurricanes, if you use historical data, your risk estimate would be off by a factor of three. So some impacts we're already seeing, and that means we have to learn to live with them and learn to adapt to them and learn how to estimate those risks. Um, the challenge with estimating risks right now is that we have climate models that are quite good at giving us an idea of global mean warming, global impacts, and the like. But when it comes to estimating risks locally and accurately, they're not quite good enough. Um, markets, for example, are now demanding climate information in part driven by um, SEC rules that are being proposed that will require companies to disclose climate risks. And those risk disclosures need to be informed by climate models, but the models we have aren't quite good enough for that purpose. And I think there are two problems. If you think of there being a value chain going all the way from data, say space-based data, ground-based data, to usable climate information, that value chain has two gaps. There's one between data and climate models. Climate models are compared with data, but data are typically not directly used to inform models in the development process. That's one gap. It's quite unlike weather prediction, where data are directly informing every weather prediction are massively assimilated. And weather predictions in part have become good because of this data assimilation um, in the last few decades. That same process doesn't happen, or an analogous process doesn't happen in climate modeling. And there's a second gap between climate models and making information usable. I showed figures from the IPCC report. You all have heard about them, I'm sure. Um, I have them all in my office. It's kind of fun to see them next to each other. The reports from the 90s to now, it's just growing in volume. The most recent had over 4,000 pages. You can't hand someone 4,000 pages and say, well, now plan your stormwater management infrastructure. That is not an effective communication strategy. So we need better ways of delivering information to people who need it, like municipal planners. So I'll fo focus mostly on this first gap and in the end talk a little bit about the second gap, what can be done there. As a result of this first gap, in part as a result of that, the data are not used extensively. Climate models diverge already in global mean predictions quite a bit. So here's a graph that shows various climate models for simulation with climate models for two scenarios, one higher, one lower emission scenario, an orange and blue. It's also from the MPCC report. And here is the two degree warming threshold. If you take that as an arbitrary threshold and ask when will we cross that threshold according to different models. So keep in mind we had 1.2 degrees warming so far. Um, so there are, two, there are some models here that says we have already crossed two degrees warming. Well, that's clearly wrong. 
Um, and there are other models under the lower emission scenarios that it might be until the end of the century before we cross two degrees warming. And there's just a huge spread in between in the time at which this two degree warming threshold is, is crossed that, that makes these types of predictions hard to use for engineering purposes. The uncertainties are very large. Part of it is lack of use of data. Um, I'll talk about some other reasons for these uncertainties and evidently biases and some models here are clearly wrong. The biggest problem in climate models are small scale processes and that's quite similar in many engineering applications that I'm sure several of you are working on that we have governing equations. They present many scales and we cannot resolve all the scales we would need to resolve to accurately represent the system. And some of the scales that we can't resolve in a climate system give rise to clouds, for example. So a typical climate model, you have resolutions around 100 kilometers right now, going towards tens of kilometers. And here's just this a satellite image of stratocumulus clouds. Um, the dynamical scales in those clouds are of order of tens of meters. So it's a vast gap between the scales that control cloud cover, which in turn controls the energy balance of Earth because clouds reflect sunlight, have a greenhouse effect, and the scales we can actually resolve. Clouds are the biggest source of uncertainties and biases in climate models. There are others, ocean turbulence that we cannot resolve as another source and the like. And so you can look at the computational problem a bit more quantitatively as follows. Um, just focus on atmospheric turbulence alone. And here is the energy density, the spectral energy density as a function of inverse wavelength or length scale. So 10 to the minus three means uh, this is a length scale of 1,000 kilometers. 10 to the two means it's a length scale of 10 meters on here. And that's just the spectrum of turbulence for horizontal motion in blue and vertical motion in red as measured from aircraft. And the dashed lines are just my extrapolations of the spectra across the entire range. And if you integrate over the spectra from left to right, integrate over a wave number, you get the cumulative energy that's contained in the wave number range going from here 4,000 kilometers to well, whatever length scale you have here, all the way down to 10 meters. And so if you look at the horizontal energy, that curve increases very rapidly because you have a pretty steep wave number to the minus three spectrum for the horizontal kinetic energy, meaning the kinetic energy is all dominated by the largest scales. So climate modeling has lived in this regime somewhere over here, resolutions from going from 1,000 kilometers in the 80s, 90s to 100 kilometers now where you have more or less you have more or less reached a plateau in terms of the horizontal kinetic energy we can resolve, resolve. But for vertical motions, it has a, they have a very flat spectrum at large scales and are generally weak on large scales relative to horizontal motions because of rotational constraints, geostrophic balance. And so the cumulative energy in the vertical kinetic energy increases quite slowly. And so we are at resolutions around 100 kilometers here, going towards tens. There are some proposals going towards a kilometer resolution. And what the higher resolution gives you is a better resolution of vertical motion, especially. Horizontal motion has more or less reached saturation. And if there would be no computational constraints, well, what you would do is look at this graph. This stops at 10 meters. It, in reality, it goes down to millimeter ranges. But what you would say is, well, let's go as far as we can to the right here, right? The challenge is that the computational demands scale like the resolution in the horizontal to the third power. So going from 100 kilometer to 10 kilometer resolution requires a factor of 1,000 and compute. From 10 to 1 kilometer, another factor of 1,000 and compute. So that's, that's the big challenge. So you can take a decade between these ticks here, and each decade is a factor of 1,000 in flops that you need. So there are trade-offs. You need to decide where on this curve you want to, do, want to be, given the computational constraints and other constraints you might have. And I'd argue we'll have to live for the time being somewhere in this realm here, where we are in a 10 kilometer range, because everything else is too expensive to generate the many simulations we need. Although ideally, you like to go as far to the right as you can. So we'll resolve maybe half of the vertical kinetic energy in this range. And the other half, we need to represent parametrically in some other fashion. Again, a common problem in computational science and engineering. Small scales you need to resolve in some semi-empirical fashion, and we'll have to keep doing that for the time being. 
here is, um, you can ask more quantitatively, when can we resolve everything we want to resolve here? In short answer is never, but a bit more quantitatively. This is the peak performance of the world's fastest computer from 1979 onwards on a log scale. Um, the early climate models go back to the 1960s, 1970s. Computer performance has increased by a factor 10 to the, almost 10 to the 12 since then, over the scale 10 to the 9. So it's, it's really magic, the exponential increase in computer performance, and it keeps going. And I don't have the latest DOE points on here. I'll, I'll do it one day and extend the graph. This is a few years ago. It keeps growing exponentially. It's really remarkable. Here, is the, here are all climate models until 2017 when we published this. Um, plotted in terms of their horizontal resolution. And the way this is plotted is so that there's a factor, a power of four difference between the left and the right axis because you need 10 to the four times the compute to increase resolution isotropically in the horizontal and vertical by a factor 10. And you see that the climate models, these are atmosphere models first, atmosphere ocean models, earth system models and the like, their resolution has increased but rather slowly compared with the increase in, in peak performance of computers. So the scale of the axis is such if all performance increase would go into increasing resolution isotropically, these orange dots should follow the blue line. And the slope is shallower saying the models have become more complex. They always use the biggest computers we have at DOE and other facilities. The models have become more complex, but not all performance increase has gone into resolution. You could ask, well, suppose from here on, well, we are here now somewhere, all performance increase will go into resolution, and suppose flops keep doubling every 1.2 years as they have. That's probably not realistic, but it has remained true for longer than anyone thought it could remain true. Um, then low clouds that control the energy balance of our tropical oceans, for example, you'd be able to solve in 20, resolve in 2060 assuming exponential increases continue for that long, which is not realistic, probably. So there's, there's no way to compute yourself out of the problem is the bottom line here. We'll need to find some way of representing clouds and the like accurately without, having, without being able to resolve them explicitly. And that's just turbulence. This is just turbulence scales. In, in some ways, the problem is even harder because below the scale of turbulence lie yet smaller scales for example, controlling the droplet growth, ice crystal growth in clouds. And this is the realm of cloud microphysics. There's a myriad of processes on nanometer scale, micrometer scale that matter for the global scale climate, matter fundamentally for the global scale climate. So the core challenge in all of climate modeling, as in many computational science and engineering domains, is bridging scales from small to large. So in the climate setting, we have large scale variables, temperature, humidity, and the like on some computational grid, and what we want are, again, large-scale effects, like cloud albedo, precipitation, and the like. But these large-scale effects come about by all sorts of tiny-scale processes that matter. And we have to bridge the scales from these tiny scales to large scales that we need in some fashion. And that's sort of the crux of the matter. How can we do it? So computing is going to help, and it's, it's helping remarkably, but because of the the uh, rapid increase of computational cost with resolution, it's not going to be the solution in itself. The amount of data we have is also truly remarkable. NASA alone gives us about 50 terabytes of data about Earth every day. And here's just one example of cloud cover observations from CloudSat and Calypso, two and MODIS as well, three satellite systems. So we live in the golden age of Earth observations, and we want to use that data together with the compute. We also can do high resolution simulations. Here is one example of what's called a large eddy simulation, which is a bit of a misnomer because it resolves small eddies from an atmospheric perspective. Um, that resolves clouds quite accurately. This is a Caribbean cloud field, blue is precipitation, and you can animate this. We know this is a good simulation. It's, it doesn't resolve the microphysics, but resolves all the dynamics of clouds well. The problem is this computational scaling means we can only do this in small domains. This is a few kilometers on the side. We can go to a few tens of kilometers now routinely, but you cannot do it globally. It's just prohibitive computationally. But these simulations do give you data where observations alone may not suffice. Observations, for example, don't, cannot give you information about turbulence inside clouds. Um, those kinds of simulations can give you that information, and you want to use this jointly. 
So this Klima project that David mentioned is a joint project between MIT, Caltech, and uh, JPL. It's about 60 scientists, applied mathematicians, engineers, working together, building a new climate model or system model. Where the idea is we want to learn from data more extensively than previous models while exploiting modern compute infrastructure. And learning from data is, of course, easy to say, and no one would disagree, I think, that we should do it. The challenge is, how do you do it? Um, deep learning has been extremely successful and in some ways suggests itself that you want to use it, but there's a few key requirements that especially climate models need to satisfy um, that are not so easily met. And I would say there are three key requirements. Number one is that we want to predict a climate for which we do not have data. Data for the future are not available. So that climate is out of the observed distribution of climates. It will involve heat extremes that simply haven't occurred on Earth before. So you need generalizability out of the sample, out of the observed distribution is, is absolutely essential for climate prediction. One hard problem with climate modeling is that we cannot verify the predictions on the time, time scales we would like to be able to verify them. You need users of the information in the end to trust a prediction without having an independent verification. In weather forecasting, you're right or wrong once a day. In climate forecasting, you're right or wrong too, but on time scales that are not helpful for decision making. So what this means is that models need to be interpretable. You need to be able to tell a causal story of how an effect comes about in a, star in a model. You don't want a black box model that fits the present climate great, but then produces something for a future climate you cannot trace where it comes from. And we want to quantify uncertainties for engineering purposes, obviously important um, to provide risk estimates. You know, what's the risk of crossing a certain temperature threshold or precipitation threshold? And that risk estimate necessarily requires quantified uncertainties in our predictions. So these three requirements are essential and are hard to meet but can be met. If you think about deep learning, it has been incredibly successful and if you want to reduce the reason for its success to one word, that word is over-parameterization. The deep learning operates in a realm where the number of parameters exceeds the sample size, often by, by a lot. It operates in a realm where statisticians would have told you for a long time you shouldn't go. And the remarkable thing is that in that realm, where the number of parameters is very large, you get very expressive models. The downside is that these methods are extremely data hungry. You need a lot of data to estimate all these parameters. And because these models contain many parameters in fairly opaque ways, they're hard to interpret and it becomes very challenging to do uncertainty quantification because you are in that realm where classic statistics doesn't apply. The opposite extreme and parametric complexity is reductionist science. Take Newton's law of universal gravitation. It's a one-parameter law that um, adequately describes how apples fall from trees, planets orbit stars, and the like. Extremely generalizable, extremely easy to do uncertainty quantification, and after people got used to spooky action at a distance, it's also fairly interpretable. However, Finding the equivalent of something like Newton's law, say, for a cloud cover on Earth would be nice, and many have tried, me including, it has more or less failed. I mean, in, in very complex system, this reductionist approach in itself becomes challenging to carry through. But I think what will work and what is working in, in what we are currently doing is combine the best of both worlds. Learn from data where reductionist science reaches its limits, but don't throw overboard all the physics and the like that we already know, but use it. So we're building a newer system model that has at its core sort of process-based models for the atmosphere, ocean, land, with the physical equations that we know. And um, we want to inform these model components with data. We're currently doing this individually for model components, eventually jointly through some data assimilation machine learning layer leveraged all around that. And in my view, success here rests on, on, on three legs. One is advanced theory to build prioritizations for small-scale processes that are better than existing processes. Um, harness data and diverse data, observations, computationally generated data, and the like, and leverage computing powers, such as what DOE, for example, has, uh, GPU-based supercomputers, as best as you can. 
for example, what you can do with a compute is do distributed high resolution simulations. So how do you do this? What matters in climate are statistics of the system. What you want to know is what is the risk of crossing a certain temperature threshold in Washington DC 30 years from now. That's a statistic or mean temperatures and the like. So it suggests itself to learn from statistics about the climate system, temporal aggregates of, of weather variations. And that's what we are doing for learning from data. That helps resolve a few problems. For example, there's an often quoted mismatch between the resolution of observations and simulations because statistics vary smoothly in space and time. That mismatch becomes less acute of a problem. These statistics can include extreme value statistics, whatever you like. Um, what it means is that learning from data for us is not supervised learning. Supervised learning requires you to have data at the process level, which we usually do not have. Say, we do not have data about the turbulence inside clouds to, to directly learn from that. But we have cloud cover statistics. So what we are doing is learn from things like cloud cover statistics, but that means you want to represent small scale processes for which we do not have direct data. You need to treat the learning as an inverse problem rather than as supervised learning. And I'll sketch out how we do it. The advantage of doing that, it guarantees stable models. It has always been an issue with uh, deep learning approaches combined with computational models that they often end up being unstable. If you focus on the statistics, they're guaranteed to be stable. But it becomes extremely expensive because evaluating the loss function becomes expensive. You need to run a climate model for seasons, years to accumulate these statistics. And you need to do this many times to minimize the loss function. This is one example of the statistics I'm talking about. This is a seasonal cycle of sea ice in the Arctic. And black is observations, and the colored lines are various uh, climate models. This is just a seasonal cycle of the last few decades. And you see that the climate models diverge from observations by, by large factors, uh, somewhat disconcertingly large factors, in fact. I mean, some climate models produce much too, much too much sea ice in winter, some too few, some too little. And the discrepancies between models are larger than the climate signal we want to predict in the next few decades. This climate signal is indicated by the black arrow here. This is roughly the expected change in sea ice cover in the next few decades. And so this is a statistic. Models are doing poorly in capturing a statistic. And if models do poorly, it's an opportunity to try to use the mismatch to improve the models. And that's the kind of statistic we are looking at, the kind of statistic we are using. So how do you do this? Um, I want to spare you a lot of math, but I do want to sketch out how you can learn from climate statistics about parameters deep inside the model that are not directly measurable, where the parameters are not directly measurable. And if you think of the climate model as being a mapping from parameters, and these parameters can be traditional physical parameters or weights, biases, and neural network, theta, to, to statistics, y. Um, the problem we have is that we have some statistics y, some climate models and mapping from theta to these statistics y, and there's some noise, eta, that, um, by which, with which these statistics are affected, for example, because of chaotic variability in the data or observational noise and the like. So the challenge is to, given y, learn theta. And standard methods for doing that would be things like Markov chain Monte Carlo, typically require 100,000, a million evaluations of the forward model G. You cannot run a climate model 100,000 or a million times. It's computationally prohibitive. So the algorithm we came up with that reduces this problem to something that's computationally manageable, we call it calibrate emulate sample, and it works as follows. We use common inversion, a variance of common inversion, to essentially solve an optimization problem, just get some close to optimal value of theta, given the data y. And what it does, what common inversion effectively does is sample in high dimensional parameter spaces in such a way that you get points near the posterior maximum where you want to be. And typically it needs a few iterations, typically it needs ensembles of size 100, so you end up with hundreds to maybe a thousand climate model evaluations, which is doable. And then you have a few hundred to a thousand pairs of parameters and simulate statistics y, and on these Pairs, you can train an emulator, Gaussian process, a neural network, random feature model, whatever you like. And 
and that's pretty cheap computationally. And what's even cheaper is evaluating the, the um, emulator of this mapping from parameters to statistics. So in the end, you can sample from this emulated mapping with, say, standard Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. You can do it a million times. It costs next to nothing um, compared with running a climate model. And the upshot of the whole algorithm is that the expensive step is this common inversion step and requires 500, 1,000 or so evaluations of a model. But that's about a factor 1,000 less than what brute force MCMC would require. And it's, it's probably giving you good estimates of um, uncertainty in certain cases. It essentially speeds up Bayesian learning by roughly a factor 1,000. And that's what we're doing with the climate model, makes, makes learning from data computationally feasible. And importantly, makes it feasible to learn from all sorts of data about all sorts of parameters. You don't need direct input-output pairs of the processes that you want to model as in supervised learning. So we are building a model in which all components eventually jointly learn from data in, in this fashion. And let me just give you one concrete example of how this actually works. An example from modeling clouds, which is the dominant source of uncertainty. For us, the goals to make progress here are three, and they align with what I said earlier. Number one is we need to advance the physics of parentization. So there is no magic deep learning shortcut that gets you around doing physics, chemistry, biology, in this case physics. You still need to focus on the physics. And, uh, I'd be happy to talk at length about it, but that's maybe more of more interest to specialized folks. Just suffice it to say that the physical ideas that are being used in climate models go back to the 1970s primarily. They were great for the computational and data resources available in the 1970s. They're no longer adequate for the resolutions, for example, we can achieve now. Assumptions that were made at 1,000 kilometer resolution are no longer good at 10 kilometer resolution. It requires a rethinking of the physics and it's kind of the unglamorous and maybe a bit harder work, but the part that's for us has been extremely successful, and I sketch an example of that. You want to use data extensively, so what we did is we built automated software pipelines for calibration, uncertainty quantification, where we can iterate rapidly on parentization um, with simulated data primarily right now, and I'll show you an example of that. And in the end, we want the software to run on big computers, um, computers with accelerators, be performance portable, be ready for whatever form of computing will come around in the next decade. So we're building, building new software, it's entirely new software um, that is more performance portable than, than other software and we hope will also set new standards and software quality for, for climate modeling. Um, so it becomes easy to use for research, for example. So current models cannot represent low clouds especially accurately. These are the clouds that have scales of tens of meters or so. This is an example from one particular model that's quite representative of all climate models. It shows the cloud bias in percent, so model simulations minus observations. And the key thing you see is there are these large red regions, which means these are regions in which models simulate far too few low clouds. Um, the biases are 50% or so and even higher. This color scale saturates here, and that's quite typical. So the key task to make progress is reduce these biases to something small. And just to sketch out what we are doing, um, we start with the equations of motion and don't need to go into what, it, what they are in detail. There are conservation laws that we conditionally average. And outcome conditionally averaged equations, there's a mass continuity equation, some equation for a tracer of phi. A is some area fraction, rho is density, and the like. Details for those who haven't seen it is not crucial. Just what is crucial is whenever you average a nonlinear system of equations, you end up with some terms on the right hand side, functions, that you don't know what they are a priori. So in this case, you get interaction functions between um, domains over which you conditionally average. These are sort of updrafts and clouds and the air around it. They interact through. It's called entrainment and detrainment as one example, or there are turbulent transport terms arising. And a priori, we don't know what they are, but we can reduce these functions on the right-hand side to, well, A, a we can non-dimensionalize, ask what non-dimensional groups can they depend on. We can consider certain limiting cases, uh, consider which limits they need to satisfy. And at some point, you can't go further with first principle physics. 
And at that point, you need to let the data speak and learn the rest functional forms, for example, from data. In a way, that's what fluid dynamics has done for 100 years since Prandtl times, that you reduce problems to some universal functions that ultimately you learn from data. The most famous example perhaps being something called morning obukov similarity theory. It, got, it covers the turbulence in the lowest 100 meters or so of the atmosphere. The problem was by morning obukov reduced to finding universal functions. People went out to wheat fields in Kansas in 1968, measured these functions in Kansas in summer of 1968, and these functions are used all over the globe in all times of year. And because they're universal, it actually works pretty well. It's actually a successful strategy. So the same idea here. There are some functions, universal functions, in the end we want to learn, and we'll learn them from data. So what we do is we, um, we, we build a model that encodes the physical constraints, conservation laws, and the like that, that we know, go as far as we can. We built a library of high resolution simulations driven in many parts of the globe, in this case by a climate model. And then we learn from these simulations to, to find these universal functions in these closures. Um, you can target the data acquisition, make this optimal in a statistical sense. Um, and eventually, you can close the loop in some active learning loop where you do this online. Doing this online is challenging because of load balancing issues, because these simulations are far more expensive and take longer than the course of simulations. But in principle, closing the loop would be possible. So we have generated hundreds of these high resolution simulations, more than 500, going towards 1,000 right now. Um, here is just some example of these simulation sites we used over these low cloud regions where the biases you saw before were particularly large in standard climate models. Uh, so we have synthetic data in this case in different seasons, different parts of the globe. And they cover cloud fields like stratocumulus, dense white clouds, or scattered cumulus clouds. And there are various ways of saying that this works well. So here is just a transect going through across this section here from a region that has mostly stratocumulus to one that has mostly cumulus. And this is the cloud cover in um, orange is our parentization. And blue is the ground truth, large eddy simulations, which matches observations quite well. And D is just a parameter that varies along this transect. Doesn't matter what it is right now. Um, and black is just a standard climate model. And you see standard climate models is the ensemble of climate models. They have too few clouds, especially on the left here in the stratocumulus region. And our reduced order model captures the entire transects extremely well. You can look at this in a bit more detail. Here is a cloud liquid in a stratocumulus cloud. Black is the ground truth, in this case, high resolution simulations. And uh, green is this reduced order model that is physics plus calibration with data. Um, say, same for shallow cumulus clouds, same for a deep convective clouds. The vertical scale here is very different. This is going to 14 kilometers. It's just the lowest three kilometers, 1.5 kilometers, including ice. And in all cases, we capture the overall distribution of the clouds quite well. Uh, you may say there's a discrepancy here. There is, but this is still vastly better than current state of the art. Um, state of the art, I mean, essentially no parameterization cap captures these stratocumulus clouds, for example. They're extremely challenging, even computationally. So what we have done as one example, we've developed this physics-based unified scheme for representing turbulence, convection, and clouds. We, pr we produced extensive data sets for calibrating these schemes um, and used this machine learning framework to learn from the data where machine learning you need to understand broadly. It, it, it means treating the problems here as inverse problems. And we do use some neural networks in some of these parameterizations, but they're quite shallow. It's rather few parameters relative to, say, what you're used to from, um, from image classification. And it reduces biases by roughly factor three or so compared to state of the art. We're currently working on testing this in global, global simulations, increasing performance, and um, increasing the data coverage in high resolution simulations. It's a collaboration with Google because uh, they have bigger computers than we do. Um, next step is learn from actual observations. This was all the simulated data, and for that, we need the integration in, in the large scale model, and it's what we're working on. 
So this was one example of how to bridge this first gap in the value chain from data to climate models. And in the remaining few minutes, let me just say a few words about additional computational opportunities about the second gap, about how to make climate model output more usable. And the, the issue here is this. The damages from climate-related disasters are increasing quite rapidly. There are roughly $150 billion a year in the US alone. The colors here are a number of billion dollar disasters. The black line is the cost of those. The cost has roughly quintupled in the last few decades. It's not climate change alone. Part of it is also building expensive properties in coastal areas and the like. But no matter, the cost is increasing. We need to be able to assess risks of climate disasters. Adaptation to climate change has large benefit cost ratios. The various uh, Measures you can look at, they all carry benefit cost ratios between 3 to 1 to 13 to 1, strengthening early warning systems, as some are 9 to 1 or something, making infrastructure more resilient, right sizing stormwater management infrastructure, some are around 5 to 1 and the like. So, what you need is climate information that's useful for adaptation, meaning locally granular, accurate, coming with quantified uncertainties. What I showed you is how to get to climate model output that will have quantified uncertainties, it will be on scales of tens of kilometers because that's computationally feasible. But you know you need to get to local information. And this is a realm where um, AI broadly understood deep learning methods, I think, have large potential. Here's just one sketch of an example. So we have um, climate simulations at medium resolution, tens of kilometers. We have some simulations at very high resolution for these clouds that I showed you um, that we can embed in a high resolution simulation. And what we want is high resolution everywhere, but we cannot get this by brute force computing. But the way you can get it is use generative models, generative AI, and there are various ways of doing that. And one is that you um, learn the mapping from low resolution to high resolution. Here's some example based uh, on, on GANs, generative adversarial models. It's worked by Catherine Deck and Toby Bishop. They have since done this with uh, diffusion models, which is the technology behind you know, ChatGPT and the like. And in, what you see in the middle is a low resolution simulation. This is just a two dimensional turbulence case with some precipitation in it. Um, on the right is just the high resolution ground truth that you use for training, but importantly, there is no matched pairs of low resolution and high resolution data. Um, you don't have these matched pairs in, in climate modeling because of chaotic divergence of trajectories. And on the right is an AI generated high resolution simulation. And, and the key is the right and the left are practically indistinguishable in their statistics, captures extreme value statistics and the like, but generating the high resolution simulations on our right is something like a factor 250, oh, 512 times faster um, than, the, than the medium resolution simulation on which it was trained. So it's one way of generating the high resolution output that you need for engineering purposes. So what we want in the end is, well, A, accelerate climate science, but B, become a hub for actionable information. And the way this will work is that we are building this back-end model that learns from diverse data sources, high-resolution simulations, observational data, and the like. Um, you downscale the information from those simulations with, for example, these generative AI methods. And then you build a hub of, of applications on top of it that processes downscaled information into what's actually to be used by engineers. So, hazard loss models, for example, for the insurance industry, or detailed flood models for water management and the like, that you can all build on top of the climate model output. We are starting to do some of that, for example, for um, river modeling, using AI tools there as well. It's actually very satisfying to see how quickly you can make progress with, with those tools for some of these downscale, appli downscale applications. And hopefully, um, there are many of these applications that can build on top of it that f inform adaptive adaptation planning, resilient infrastructure planning, and the like. So to conclude, I think there are, there are many scientific, engineering, even commercial opportunities in this space. By combining AI tools and computing judiciously, and while I haven't given you details on how to do it, I hope I've sketched out how to do it. Reducing and quantifying uncertainties in climate models is obviously urgent, and I think it's within reach following the program I outlined. 
And the program consisted of combining process-informed models with machine learning tools that harness climate statistics. That treats machine learning as an inverse problem, so you can learn neural networks with this common inversion approach. Not widely known, but you can do it. We have done it. And that allows you to harness just about any data, noisy, multi-fidelity data and the like, that you think might be useful. And you end up with models that are fairly sparsely parameterized. What the physics gives you is reduced data demands. And these models are capturing cloud regimes, for example, quite well in, across all regimes that occur on Earth. It's a problem that has vexed climate modeling for decades, and this comes as close to a solution as, as one can get. This Calibrate Emulate Sample algorithm is the computational backbone for learning from data, speeds up learning by a factor of 1,000. We have nice software that you can get from our web page. That algorithm should be good for just about any science and engineering problem that, that is of similar character, which are many. So I'll stop here. Thanks to our funders, um, funded by DOD, NSF, Eric and Wendy Schmidt, our major funders of this project, and the Cisco Foundation. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.